Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm very happy to be here today. My name is Dimitri Tsiflidze, and I'm a principal engineer at net company Introsoft, where I work on all aspects of uh, uh, mobile development. So that includes applications, SDKs, tools, uh, CICDs, that kind of stuff. Um, I'll be very happy to connect online if you want. If you put my name into your favorite search engine, my GitHub will show up, my LinkedIn, and my uh, Medium blog where I occasionally uh, write about mobile development. So today, I'll be talking about how our team uh, made KMM work for us. KMM being the Kotlin-based technology that is used to be able to build shared code that could be shared by multiple mobile applications on iOS and Android. Uh, we'll examine how it became a game changer for us in building scalable and efficient mobile application. So to that end, I'll be going through some uh, real-world uh, examples and best practices and discussing how it empowers uh, developers to write and share code in order to reduce duplication, increase maintainability, leverage their platform expertise, and uh, write code that is uh, elegant. So once again, uh, thank you very much for being here. Before I get started, uh, just a quick word on uh, the company that I work for, Net Company Introsoft, largest IT services company in Greece, recently acquired uh, by Net Company, um, with uh, a long track record of being a key player in the European institutions for more than uh, 20 years, has completely an agile transformation recently, and that's how we build our stuff over there and also having a strong public sector and enterprise uh, business unit with um, uh, work carried out in the sectors of banking, finance, and fintech, uh, security, and telecommunication. Our team was here the past couple of days. I hope you had the opportunity to go and speak to them to see how they could help you with the next step in your uh, career should you decide to join us. So thank you very much, Net Company, Introsoft. So, just one thing before we get started. Uh, the product name KMM has been deprecated uh, from the vendor in favor of using KMP. So, KMP is um, uh, the acronym of choice uh, when referring to this type of technology. Uh, we got the impression that perhaps uh, the name hasn't caught on 100% yet and may be only used by early adopters. Um, therefore, we opted to continue with KMM uh, for the purposes of this presentation. However, over the course of the presentation, I'll be phasing out KMM and slowly phasing into using KMP. So, for the agenda today, we'll discuss how uh, we decided to use KMM and how that empowers you to write um, shared code. Up next, we'll look into the, delve into the app architecture aspect of things, and I'll be spending some time discussing the app, app architecture that we chose to use, which is called MVI, in order to be able to make KMM work for us. Any technology, of course, always comes with uh, its unique challenges. This technology, KMP, not being uh, an exception at all. So I've curated a couple of issues that our team ran into, and uh, I'll be sharing them here with you. And finally, as your project grows, so does the need to scale your team. So I'll be going through a couple of strategies that we employed in order to make this transition as smooth as possible. So by the very end, I hope to have communicated to you the value of this technology and maybe you might give it a shot yourself in your own projects. Uh, before we get started, let's uh, want to share a couple of thoughts I have on uh, what uh, scaling means in a mobile context. So scalable mobile development um, should enable the undemanding 
uh, onboarding and offboarding of teams and individuals, and they should be able uh, to work uh, unfettered and uh, individually, so projects could grow and contract with uh, minimal disruption. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, we practice this ourselves uh, on a recent project in one of the use cases that I'll be going over very soon. And uh, we're very happy to see that the results were great. In, in this particular scenario, we had to onboard roughly about a dozen developers. They came into the project, they assisted with the delivery and the final stretch, so to speak. They implemented the features and then they were offboarded to where they came from, which was other projects within the company. Vertical feature teams can work on different parts of the application, thus accelerating the overall development process and delivering uh, stable features promptly. And I mentioned MVI before as our pattern of choice and your app architecture should make testing simple. It should facilitate the separation of concerns and provide clear interfaces in order for you to test your components in isolation. Uh, I work on both uh, sides of KMM. I have a bit of preference on the iOS side of things. So on iOS in particular, we leverage what we call protocol-oriented programming. So we use protocols that uh, define a specification that our classes have to implement. We pass that around. And for our unit testing, that allows us to be able uh, to mock uh, classes and stub data easily. And all this uh, should make uh, the code base understandable and readable by anybody that joins because in a particular use case uh, that will be going over, uh, the, the project has a tendency to grow and contract uh, quite regularly uh, because at some point we had to implement stuff very quickly. At another point, not all these people uh, were needed. So that's the problem that we were trying to solve also with all this. And by maintaining a clean separation of concerns and utilizing uh, modularity, you make sure that you do not um, uh, introduce complex dependencies into your applications. Um, sorry. So, we conducted a thorough evaluation of pretty much every hybrid uh, solution that is available uh, on the market everything. And what stood out was React Native and Flutter. Uh, what we wanted to locate was something that was in alignment uh, in our own specific requirements, which I'll go over here now. Shared business logic, independent UI, uh, time efficiency, and a minimum, minimal learning curve. Uh, React Native uses uh, JavaScript, uh, Flutter uses a language called Dart, so a bit of a learning curve there. Um, but also, they do not facilitate uh, shared business logic. These are end-to-end -end solutions. You have to build the whole thing in, in Flutter. And uh, something that showed up recently was uh, Skip.Tools. So what's Skip.Tools? It's a new solution. You build in Swift, and they have a transpiler that takes your Swift and Swift UI code and converts it into Kotlin and Compose. Looks very interesting. We are under the impression that it's not quite done yet, but we'll definitely be looking at it closely uh, over the you know, medium term. Kotlin is quite easy, well, quite easy to be picked up by Swift developers. Some of them have already been on Android projects so they know Kotlin quite well. The ones that don't might be very familiar with uh, the syntax. And we saw that in practice. And in KMM, it's very important to focus on the fact that uh, we're talking about business logic. So we're, we're taking out the Android overhead of uh, uh, building an app and just focus on the more foundational business logic stuff. So it's a smaller subset for Kotlin to learn. 
The UI is fully native, very important also, because we get to leverage the, ex uh, the expertise of platform developers, and more on that soon. And also, by using the native APIs, you get full access to some world-class accessibility systems that the platform holders have built, um, which are kind of found wanting in uh, the hybrid solutions that I mentioned earlier. And accessibility is very important to us because it allows pretty much everyone uh, that might have uh, uh, the need to use the accessibility features to be able to use our applications. And uh, as you can see, the case for KMM is uh, growing quite strong at this stage. And the final uh, checkbox that's been ticked is the fact that uh, it does indeed uh, deliver what it says on the description. You can have a native uh, UI and uh, you can have a shared business logic. Uh, so that's great. And uh, we chose it and we opted to use it for our use cases. First use case, a major athletic organization of which, unfortunately, I cannot share their name. But they're huge, they're based in Switzerland, and they organize tournaments every few years. I suppose that narrows it down a bit for you. So what they wanted was a mobile app with many features, including scores, live scores, uh, schedules, uh, heaps of content, uh, articles and video. All this was backed by a headless CMS and uh, the CMS was maintained by some human editors and human editors were responsible for shaping the entire app, everything. What articles will appear, what content appears, the theme, because every international event they had had a special theme with its own typography and colors. And there's also a requirement by the client um, for the iOS app and the Android app to be identical. But mainly it was a several hundreds of REST requests that we had to implement. Second case, uh, a local payment provider wanted an SDK to give to their clients. Who were their clients? Other app developers, they wanted to integrate payments into their application. So what the SDK had to do was manage their payments and uh, manage authentication and provide a, a very simple UI, a form that uh, their clients, their app, the other app developers were able to integrate into their app. Why KMM in this case? Well, when it, working on these types of SDKs, um, issues get to, uh, tend to get rather unpleasant because money and payments are involved. So a single code base for the business logic side of things for us it gave us reassurance that we only had to look into one code base every time something went wrong. Not a lot of things get, went wrong, but nonetheless, reassurance matters. So two use cases. Um, in case you were wondering, or even if you're not, uh, I think I'll spend some time on why didn't we just use a, a total uh, vertical uh, hybrid solution and get rid of the entire native uh, component. Because Compose multi-platform exists. Um, maybe it's in beta now. Maybe it's 1.0. We don't know. But for us, it's very important uh, to leverage platform expertise. And we have a very good reason that we want that. Uh, why we want Android developers and iOS developers in particular. Because no matter how good your vertical solution is, you always will have to interface with uh, the OS and the platform-specific APIs. If you want to do push notifications, location services, um, widgets, deep links, interface with uh, Bluetooth, uh, low energy Bluetooth, uh, local networking, uh, the list goes on and on. I'm going to stop here. There's many, many more. I just wanted to punctuate the fact 
that you always need your platform developers and also you know compose and swift ui uh, are awesome they're great they're next generation declarative ui frameworks where you uh, they're state-based and they make great use or implementation that is of accessibility so that's the reason we did not go fully hybrid So let's talk about our applications architecture a bit. <clears throat> so we have this uh, pyramid. Um, at the very bottom is our data layer, where our repositories live, which act as an abstraction for data storage. Then our DTOs live there also, which uh, are the objects in transit, and usually the output of your repository is mapped onto those services, third-party SDKs, uh, remote services, local storage, secure storage, everything lives here. And this is fully uh, KMM, no native code. It knows nothing about what's higher up in the pyramid. Uh, it just knows about itself. Next up in the pyramid, business logic. So the rules of your system, your interactors, your use cases, your business, your domain objects, your state management, and finally your validation to make sure that your data has consistency and integrity. The business logic layer knows about the layer below, knows about itself, doesn't know anything about the layer above, which is the presentation layer. And business logic, by the way, 100% KMM, shared. And then you have your presentation layer. And the presentation layer contains your view models, it contains your navigation, so your navigation is, um, governs the traversal uh, between uh, screens as uh, is caused by the users that are using your application. Uh, the view models manage the state and also the theming that we talked about before is here. Not all applications offer theming, uh, however, in 2023, you at least have light mode and dark mode. So one very simple implementation at least you will have okay and this is roughly 70 percent 30 percent shared versus native and next up is the top of the pyramid or trapezoid we talked about swift ui and compose this is where the ui lives this is who where the user interacts with and we also get the legacy systems and i don't mean that in a derogatory way UI kit and Android XML. There's millions of apps in production at the moment being maintained that use um, this technology, and we have to make sure that our architecture supports that. So, next up, um, let's talk about the architecture. You could say that this is a different view uh, of the pyramid that we saw before. Uh, we use MVI, Model View Intent, for a unidirectional architecture. Um, this system contains three actors, view, four, view, view model and state, and model. And these map pretty well over uh, to the pyramid we saw before. So the view is the UI layer, uh, the view model contains the state, and that's your presentation layer, and everything below that, business logic, and your data layer is managed by the model. So a view causes an event onto the view model. The view model causes an effect on the model that gathers its data or carries out its business functions, which then updates the state, changes it, and then the view reacts to the state change. And this works for gate for unit testing because effectively we can test the UI by having this scheme we can initiate events from within our unit test. Uh, the event will be able to uh, cause a, an effect, and our unit test passes if the effect is what we expect. So if a user press a button that causes an alert to appear, if we get the effect of the alert appear back, then our test passed. So it's quite a smart way to be able to test your uh, unit test UI without having a UI test. 
And you do all this in perpetuity for your entire app's lifecycle. So there are a couple of boundaries here. And in this context, uh, KMP uh, manages everything below the view model layer and also native manages everything above the view model layer. And uh, so that's why we've got that 70-30% um, uh, analogy in the pyramid before. The view model is the only source of truth for this platform. And everything that interfaces with the native layer is done via the view model. Uh, let's unpack here what it says. So, um, th this is a decision we made. In KMM, you can build all your classes and have those being used natively on Android and iOS. We completely opted out of that. We're not doing that at all. What we want to do is to be able to say that I want the native layer to only interface with the state that it gets in the view model. So we're not calling any code uh, from Kotlin directly into Swift, for instance. And the same thing for Android. Okay? So we want to maintain this single source of truth. And it's worth mentioning here that in the MVI architecture, we have uh, one state object, um, and then internally you can have as many properties as you like. Whereas in MVVM, you might have multiple state properties. And for all this, uh, on iOS only, because it's a different language, you still need an iOS facade for your native layer, because uh, the generated Swift code for, from Kotlin is not compatible with what our goal is there. And what is our goal is there? To have a UI react immediately and automatically with um, a state object. And that's not supported by Kotlin, because Kotlin creates Objective-C code, not Swift. Therefore, uh, anything related to Swift and Swift UI is not compatible. So you have to create a facade. And what's a facade? An interface that handles communication with some deeper uh, code below. And this is what the Android view model looks like. Um, it inherits from a base view model that our team wrote, and it manages events, states, and effects. And I've just pasted here the relevant overrides that matter to us. And these are the state. So you're probably noticing here that we're initiating a state when we begin. And then we have a handle event uh, function. And what the handle event function does is uh, handle events, I suppose. So event comes in, it, it switches all the possible states for the event, finds the one that it wants, and then updates the state. Okay? And I've noticed throughout this conference, this comes up a lot. It came up in the previous talk. We never modify state or state properties directly. If we want to change the state, we create a new state, a copy, update the value we want in the initializer, and reassign the whole thing to a new state. And why do we do that? Because we don't want to manage side effects that arise whenever you have to deal with mutability. And we saw that in the keynote too. There was a whole chapter dedicated to mutability, so it really comes down to here, use, to this, using value type semantics in order to avoid mutability and the side effects and bugs that come along with that. So, you know, Android and Kotlin view model is quite simple. Um, things get a bit more involved in Swift, but really nothing super um, uh, challenging or out of the ordinary. I mentioned protocol-oriented programming up there. Our payment view model implements that protocol in order to get all those overrides. Everywhere we use the view model, we pass the protocol, not the concrete type. So that allows us in our unit test at some point to pass mock objects. Then this view model 
uh, inherits from the payment view model from Android. So I'm just going to put like a semicolon there and get that in a second. And I'd like to draw your attention to the observable object. And the observable object is the whole reason that this view model exists. Observable object is a protocol in Swift that allows Swift UI views to react to changes in variables within this object. And these objects are annotated with the published property wrapper. At published, that's Swift syntax, it's called a property wrapper. And that means that if a UI makes a reference to this project, it is this uh, object or variable, it updates uh, the view with a new value. This also has to be initiated in Swift. So if we move down into the initializer, you see this collect function running twice. You don't need that on the Android view model. This is some magic code that our Android guys wrote just for us on the Swift side. And in effect, what does it do? Your, every time the state changes, the entire new state object comes in and you just assign the whole thing onto your own state. And this is bound to a view and the view would react and change right away. Same thing for effects. Effects are a bit different though. State changes can happen at any random point in time. Uh, effects kind of have cause and effects uh, ergonomics associated with them. They happen once and they're usually caused by some action that you actually carried out. So in this case, we have this effect that by contract we've been told and we know, or maybe we were part of this design, we know that it should show an alert when it appears. So we make a show alert published variable in Swift. And that way, we've uh, managed to react to the effect change. And that's pretty much it. At the base of all this is the base view model in Kotlin. Way too much code to go over, but pretty much what it does, it has a state flow for your Y state, a shared flow for your events, and a channel for your effects. And it's written by one of my colleagues. It's open source. You can have a look at it right now. I'm gonna move on to the next slide. You can, if you didn't have time to scan it, uh, come up to me later and we can do it again. And you need to implement those two collect methods, as I said, that are used just from Swift. And on the Swift side only, you have to subscribe to those two methods. And that's how you get your new state and your effects. On Android, you don't have to do that at all. So right now, or up until now, uh, this is like a, a folder structure on your PC, kind of, for uh, Kotlin. Everything we've talked about so far resides in the shared folder. But at some point in time, you might want to interface with platform-specific APIs. And that's when you put your code either into Android main or iOS name main. The uh, real names are a bit different, but uh, I just want to get the point across that there's three types of folders. A shared one, a native Android one, and an iOS one. Okay, so let's look at an example of iOS specific code that we put in uh, the iOS main folder. So a couple of things stand out here. Uh, let me quickly go through what this class does. It initializes the preference manager that um, interfaces with your user defaults. You can get a value for a given key. You can set a value for a given key. You can remove a value and you can check if a value exists. So very simple, but very common usage in pretty much any iOS app you've seen out there. So it's funny that it uses Kotlin and up at the top, it imports foundation. So that's KMM in action. They've ported foundation over, they've somehow found a way to execute Swift foundation or actually iOS foundation in uh, a Kotlin context, I can't really say, but it works and that's what matters 
so far. However, there's kind of like some proof here that it's not interfacing with Swift, but rather with Objective-C. If it was Swift, we wouldn't have NS user defaults. We would have just user defaults, okay? Um, and that's the reason that we, in previous slides, mentioned that we're just interested in state and not at all interested in executing uh, Kotlin uh, classes converted to Swift in our Swift code just because of this limitation because Objective-C is the previous language that Swift aimed to replace. There is a lot of code out there but it's not the same scenario as what we talked about the UI frameworks. I get the impression because we speak to a lot of people and people join teams it's kind of on its way out Objective-C and not having the ability to use Swift uh, is problematic is a strong word. I can't think of something else at the moment. But you don't have concurrency and you don't have um, enums with associated values. There's a lot missing. Um, let's look at a couple of uh, issues and risks. So, error messages get, tend to be very crypt, crypt, cryptic and you don't know what's going on. And we Googled this error. We, we could not find uh, a solution. Somehow, with a combination of Xcode 15 and the error message, we landed on a, a forum post and a few queries down, sorry, a few posts down in the forum post, there was a solution that actually worked for us. Um, but this had to make everybody in the team move on to Xcode 15, which is the ID we use on iOS. Other kind of errors are the ones that you need a bit of a trial and error to kind of solve. Um, a specific combination of versions in Gradle didn't allow the shared library to be uh, compiled from the command line. And uh, we found a few forum posts. They didn't help out. They just sent us in the right direction of kind of experimenting with different combinations of uh, versions for various packages, and in the end it worked. So these are kind of like the head scratches we ran into, I believe, and they're always solvable. We didn't give up on development, um, but be prepared to, for some tinkering if you, if you do KMM stuff. You, you definitely cannot avoid that. So, scaling your team to be able to onboard and offboard people uh, needs some actions from your part. You need to establish a clear and enforceable coding guidelines and architectures, and you have to make sure that your team follows these. This one is easier said than done, but I always say if you can't find them, create them. So, try to onboard or recruit KMP savvy developers. This one, maybe you're probably thinking, does he really need to say this? Uh, yes, you will have to get your entire team on hardware that is iOS compatible, even the, 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 the Android or the KMM guys, because you need a consistent development environment in order to eradicate compatibility errors. Issue two we saw a bit earlier would not have happened, it was at the very beginning, if um, the KMM developers in the beginning had access to this hardware. They would have sold it themselves and we would never even hear about it. Uh, keep your iOS team engaged. That's a, a Greek saying. It means they have a soul too. And since they have a soul, just make sure that they're engaged and part of the development and decision-making process from the very start. And make sure also that from the very start, they contribute this to the shared code. Most of the time, they will have to contribute to the shared code anyway because you have stuff like the preferences manager that 
we talked about a bit earlier. And in order to do that, you might have to scale your iOS project. Your Android project is looking good already. So what's the deal there? What does that mean? Uh, this is what the folder looks like on Finder. At the root level, you have all the Android stuff, and your iOS app is actually a subfolder in uh, the, the director of the project. So automatically, that might not be ideal for you because you have a single repo for, for both your applications. And it definitely wasn't ideal for us because we wanted a way to build the shared code and the iOS facade uh, in a portable format, and this is for the payment SDK, that could be distributed to clients, and this does not work at all. But you need this, because if you don't have this structure, then you have no way of building the shared library. So how do you work around that? Well, first you export your iOS application in a separate iOS project. So now you've lost all access to the KMM shared code. So how do you gain access again? You need to make your shared code be distributed in a compatible form, and that's the XC framework. And Gradle can do stuff and can build an XC framework. However, our platform experts had a different idea. And they were saying, we can't really have Gradle build an XE framework for the shared library because we also need to build a second library that talks to that for the iOS facade. So we might as well do everything on the iOS side and, and save the Android guys or KMM guys some trouble. So they wrote a script that exports uh, two XE frameworks, one for the facade and one for the shared library. Um, they added them to a Swift package manifest and upload them to GitHub. In which case, then, they were available uh, to the client project. So this is an empty project that just makes use of, of these two libraries. It's in UI kit, the legacy project, not Swift UI. And also, this works for us because we also needed a way to be able to make sure that the, the packages for iOS we deliver to the client the SDK client, who in turn had to give them to their own customers, worked. Um, so we just had a reference application that made use of these. Okay. So KMM, it's a powerful tool. If you can make it work for you, good on you. It's really good. But, you know, a couple of things to think about is if your own requirements align with the, the strengths of KMM or does your use case align with uh, KMM? So, in addition to what we discussed, what else can you look at? Well, you can, you know, build a proof of concept, uh, which I highly recommend, so you can test the waters or you can even have a partial implementation on an app that exists already. Okay, and there are many ways to do that. And one of the ways is what we discussed earlier with the XC framework. We made sure that our iOS developers are engaged. I just want to add a bit that make sure that their uh, concerns are uh, um, engaged and you, you have the second thoughts quite early in the process. And also make sure that your Android team is engaged too. I did not talk about this a lot. Why? It's not really critical. Uh, the flow of code is towards uh, Swift being able to work with Kotlin. Um, it's not the end of the world if your Kotlin guys don't know anything about um, Swift. But nonetheless, if you got everybody on compatible hardware, it'll be nice also uh, to get your Android team engaged on the iOS project. And then you start building up a team that uh, gains experience in both platforms, and then you can use that elsewhere. So you really can't lose. 
So by carefully considering these points, teams can make informed decisions about adopting KMP. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Thank you. Are there any questions or feedback today? Ah, yes, sir. Um, do we have a microphone, actually? And there's two questions. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I want to ask you, do you see a future where uh, hybrid uh, applications becoming a norm and uh, we are developing this way and the native application becoming an exception or maybe obsolete? Hmm. Uh, nice question, thanks. Uh, short answer, no. Uh, long answer. This worked for us because uh, these particular implementations had pretty much zero business logic. The, the sports app was consuming a REST API and displaying it and not doing anything in the middle. And the payment SDK did everything cloud side and just had some authentication and um, got the results back to the users. I don't think that would be the case of something I mentioned in this, because of something I mentioned in this talk. Uh, KMM, at this point in time, outputs Objective C. So if I was to use KMM exclusively for my business logic, I will have to make amends with the fact that the generated classes are not exactly in a, in a format I would like, because they take zero advantage of Swift features that Objective C does not know about. So right now, the way things stand, I don't think that will be happening. But who knows what could happen in the future. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, you're welcome. Uh, I would like to ask, um, Okay, I understand the use case and uh, I got your answer. I was really curious about that, about the use case that you have to, uh, to implement. So my question is, uh, if you did some test and did you see the response, the response time uh, when you access the sensors, for example, the Bluetooth, uh, the gyroscope, the accelerometer, even uh, the push notification, uh, and also, if you see some uh, problems uh, from version to version, from, from example, from Android 12 to Android 13, okay, for Android not so much, but for iOS, for example, for 14 to 15, 15 to 16 now. Um, thanks for your question. Uh, I can't really say that I've uh, seen any um, performance penalties as versions move on. But who knows, it's pretty hard to tell because, you know, the hardware and the phones get updated. For your, your second questions, I, I never actually, um, from my point of view, uh, bothered with, for example, for BLE, trying to make it work via KMM. Uh, it, it's something that you do exclusively on native. And you also mentioned uh, BLE, uh, the little that I've used it for about a year or so. It's quite complicated with all the peripherals and characteristics. So I don't know if I would feel 100% comfortable in porting that over to KMM. But yeah, so. Mm -hmm. So this is my last, okay. Well, so let's ahead. say that we would like to develop a navigation application. So which means that navigation. So no. it needs that we have access to GPS and uh, so, you know, real time, as much as possible. Uh, will you use uh, Kotlin multi-platform for uh, iOS? It depends. Um, is there any other complexity I should know about? B because Name. I'm just going to, I'm just going to uh, repeat what I told the gentleman here. If there's not a heavy business logic component and I'm just consuming stuff cloud side, 
and maybe I need a location because I'm phoning at home somewhere, I would have zero problems to use Camman for that. But the more client-side business logic is required, the more that scenario kind of moves away. So diplomatic answer, it depends. But in, in principle, I would definitely consider it, yes. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Great to have you here. Thank you.